Hi there and welcome to Glen Abbey's online connect service today. It's so great to have you joining with us whether you're a member of Glen Abbey or a regular attendee but especially if you've joined us for these online services throughout lockdown. Our prayer is that today what you see and hear will help you meet with the living God. And as usual, we're going to see lots of different faces in our service and we're continually thankful for everyone who takes part on screen and those behind the scenes who plan and edit these services. And if you're watching with your kids, I just want to remind you that there are some brilliant videos and online activities for them. You just need to head to the Glen Abbey website and go to the Kids Online section to access these. Today our worship is led by Stevie and Corey Johnson with Chris McCauley. Our kids song with I'm sure some incredibly coordinated actions is brought to us by Huntingdale Home Group. We've also got an interview coming up with Amy Bullard who's one of our young adults. She'll be sharing about her move to Birmingham to work with TLG. One of our elders Stephen Hamill will lead us in prayer later. Today Simon Lennox is continuing uh, our I Am series in John's Gospel. Exploring what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And we'll see the difference that this statement can make to our lives today. I'm just going to quickly pray for us and then hand over to Cloudy Water Home Group who are going to lead us in a reading of Psalm 98 as we come to worship our God this morning. So let's just take a moment to pray together now. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to meet with you today that you promise us your presence. Thank you that your son Jesus doesn't just speak the truth, but that he is the truth. Truth is a person and he can be known by us. So help us now as we come to worship you. May these songs lift our eyes and our hearts to you. And later as Simon speaks, may your word directly speak into our lives. By your spirit, would you use it to change us and transform us to be more like your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in the joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity.
She's a member of Claddy Water Home Group, uh, involved with young adults and serves on Live the Adventure. But for those of you who don't know Amy, Amy, tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Amy Billard and um, as Florence says, I've been serving with um, the kids and youth and young adults um, for about five years now in Glen Abbey and I just graduated from Belfast Bible College in July last year. While Amy was at Belfast Bible College, she spent three years on placement with Release International. She completed our Changemakers programme, inspiring young people to be the change that they wanted to be in their community. During that time, God taught uh, Amy through her passion for him and for the young people what he wanted her to do and where he wanted her to go. I'm excited now that he has opened a door for Amy. So tell us, Amy, where are you going and what are you going to do? Okay, so from um, next week, I'm joining a Christian charity um, in England called Transforming Lives for Good. Um, they're a charity that work alongside local churches to provide um, help and to bring transformation in the lives of struggling families and children. And they do so by providing basic supplies for families, um, one-to-one mentoring for kids who are struggling within mainstream school, and also education centers for teens who have been excluded from mainstream school. Um, so from next week, I will be um, joining, taking a role as a trainee teacher um, in their education center in Birmingham, and where we'll be helping these kids achieve their life goals and being a witness for Jesus in that place. Amy, that's great. But I know it will be hard for you to leave Northern Ireland, to leave your home, your family and your friends. And you will be looking to us, your church family, to support you in prayer. How can we pray for you? Okay, so first of all, I have been told that I'm going to be teaching English. So you can pray that I will slow my speech and that I will learn to um, speak like an English person so they can understand me and um, that I'll adjust well to the city, to the to the new role, that I'll learn a lot and that I would represent um, Jesus well in my role. I would like to pray for you now, Amy, so let's pray. Father, thank you for Amy, this young woman of God who you have called to go and to work with transforming lives for good. May Amy know your presence and peace this week as she leaves Northern Ireland and moves to Birmingham. I pray that everything will fall into place and that you will help Amy settle into her new home, new job and new church family. I pray that Amy will be open to what you want to teach her and that she will grow in her faith as she engages with the young people. May she quickly learn her role as she teaches them. Use her, Lord, to build your kingdom, and may her life be a witness to you in both her walk and her talk. And I pray that Amy, being rooted and established in love, may have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that she may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you. Listen, you need to stand up. We're going to sing our song for the kids this morning. And it's going to be, My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. So up you get, and everybody join in with all the action.
morning. Uh, let's unite our hearts as we pray together. Let's pray. Our Father, we just thank you uh, for the beautiful weather we've been enjoying this week and uh, for the beauties of your world and your creation. And as we come together now uh, to meet, uh, we thank you for this opportunity that while we are physically separated from each other, Father, that we are still united in Christ and we can come together to worship you and to hear your word. Father, we just thank you for Amy and for what she's been telling us this morning. We thank you for her desire to serve you in this school in Birmingham, working with these very uh, uh, children who have been really uh, deprived and, and, and suffered so much in their lives. And we just pray that you would go with her uh, and, and that you would help her share your love uh, as she seeks to bring the transformation of the gospel to these young people's lives. Father, we pray for our own young people uh, at this time, particularly uh, some have had uh, A-level results this week, Father, and others are waiting for exam results, and it's been such a difficult and stressful time for them, and we just pray that you would help them as they get their results to accept these results and to look for your hand and your direction in their lives uh, through the results that they get. We think of our teachers and all those involved in education as they prepare to go back to school again in these difficult circumstances. Lord, we ask that you would go with them and help them, that you would protect them from illness uh, and from the virus. And we pray that uh, our children would be able to uh, get back to school and to be in a safe and caring environment. We just ask for all those uh, who are preparing for this return at this time. And now, Father, we, we think to uh, the words that we're going to hear from uh, Scripture this morning, and they're so familiar, uh, and yet we just pray that as Simon brings your message to us today, he would be able to do so with a freshness uh, and with a clarity that will speak to each of us as we hear these words. So, Father, we again give you all the thanks and all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Sinners plunged be. 
way, the truth, the life. Next to John 3.16, these are some of the most famous and misunderstood words spoken by Jesus Christ. One reason for this is because many people think Christianity, and particularly its teaching from and about Jesus, is simply a way of doing life that works for some, but isn't for everyone. It's just one of many life philosophies invented by humans to try to get the best out of life, to cope with the worst, or even to use against others for selfish gain. Now that interpretation fits with the popular individualist Western cultural narrative. Because after just two or three flicks down your preferred social media platform, I guarantee you'll come across cultural cliches and life maxims like these. Choose your own destiny. Become the person you wish to be for the people you love. Never give up on your dreams, no matter how crazy they seem. Do what makes you happy. Stop listening to the naysayers. Life is a gift. Time is all we have. What you do with it is entirely up to you. Or take one of the Nike adverts released during the pandemic. We know things won't always go our way, but whatever it is, we'll find a way. We have a responsibility to make this world a better place. Nothing can stop what we can do together. Powerful, motivating, appealing words from actors, sports professionals, and product brands. And that's just on my Instagram. And of course, all of these things contain some value and nuggets of truth and can actually inspire some self-willed change. But Christianity, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is not trying to compete at that level. When you focus on what it actually says, there is simply nothing in the world that comes close to what it claims and the amazing gift of salvation it offers. So whether you're familiar with these words or not, I urge you to consider again what Jesus meant when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. For Christianity, is not a human construct, a mere religion, nor a competing life philosophy. It is a person. So let's examine these words from John 14 by first putting them into context. Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room of a house in Jerusalem, celebrating the Jewish Passover meal. But the disciples are deeply troubled. Jesus, their Lord, leader, teacher, friend, whom they had given up everything to follow for three solid years, had just announced his imminent departure, that they couldn't go with him, that one of them would betray him, and that Peter the rock would deny him. They're totally flabbergasted. Then at the beginning of chapter 14, as the disciples are still processing everything their Lord said, Jesus turns their attention away from their predicted failures by asking them to do two things. One, believe in who I am, verse one. Not just a great teacher, but God incarnate standing before them. And two, know where I am going, verses two to three. Not on exile in some remote place on earth, but going to the Father to prepare a place for them from where he would one day return and take them there too. So Jesus says, do not be troubled because no matter what happens next, they must remember he is God he is going to prepare a place for them and he will be back to get them. But then Jesus says, and you know the way to where I am going, verse four. So hard-headed Thomas speaks up, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? So clearly the disciples are still concerned about Jesus going away. How will they know the way if Jesus doesn't physically show them? And how, they could, how can they be sure that they will be with him again? It's in response to that question from Thomas that Jesus says, I am the way 
and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So in this context, when Jesus says, I am the way, the first thing to note is this. He is talking about the way to the Father, not just the way to heaven. He's not simply talking about bringing us to the Father's house, but of bringing us to the Father himself. The two are not the same. For example, we could visit Buckingham Palace, but not be with the Queen. Christ's plan is to bring us into relationship with the Father. That's the first thing. The second thing is that Jesus doesn't claim to be a way. Notice that. It says, he says, he is the way to the Father. Now that doesn't go down well in a relativistic culture that we live in. The standard view is that if God exists, there are many different ways to him, different routes up the same mountain. But that can't be true for three reasons. First, because almost every religion you ask would deny that outright. Each religion presents its own exclusive claims. And secondly, the destination is not the same. How could, for example, the 300 million gods of Hinduism be the same destination as the one God and three persons of Christianity? And thirdly, the way is not the same. In most religions, the focus is on what we do to gain entrance on our service. But in Christianity, the focus is on what Jesus has done. The way in Christianity is not a technique, it is a person. And finally, Jesus is the only way to relationship with the Father, the first two points, because Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Jesus. Make sense? Well, one of the disciples, Philip, definitely didn't get that at first in verse 8. According to pragmatic Philip, it would be a lot easier if Jesus just showed them the Father and that would settle the issue. And I often hear something similar when discussing the faith with others. A question like this comes out, if God is real, why doesn't he just show himself? Well, Jesus' reply to Philip answers that too. Jesus says, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been with you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Christ had been with Philip for some three years and Philip knew that he was special, but it was hard for him to take that next step in his thinking that would bring everything into focus and conclude that Jesus was God incarnate, that Jesus, God incarnate, was standing right before him. God has shown himself. So the ultimate question then for all of us is this, who is Jesus? Is he God incarnate? So Jesus continued to Philip, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father? And that the Father is in me. The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather it is the Father living in me. Who is doing his work. Believe me when I say. That I am in the Father. And the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So God was not remote as Philip thought. The person Reclining at the table with them was God in human form. Think about that. The person who had, with great humility, washed their feet was God. The person who was now speaking to them about the Father's house was not speaking simply from himself. God was speaking. The words they were hearing were the words of God. So Christ was in the Father and the Father was in Christ. Do you, like Philip, right now find it hard to take that in? Well, if so, 
then follow Philip by thinking of the works that Jesus did, the miracles that they witnessed that we're reading about. They were not some independent activity of Christ as a miracle worker. He was in the Father and the Father was in him. He was doing the works and the Father was doing the works through him. So Christ was not a mindless mouthpiece. He was speaking the words, doing the works, and yet not on his own. He is in the Father and the Father in him. The Father does his works through him. The source was the Father. But Christ was actually doing the speaking and doing the works. So we are to look at the evidence of the words and works for they point to who Jesus is God incarnate. That brings us nicely to the next thing Jesus says. I am the truth. And here's a few things to note about that. Firstly, Jesus is not saying that he knows a truth that everyone else should know or that he simply says true things. He is saying that he is the truth. This is also a very big and unpopular claim, particularly in the West, where many people believe that while there may be such a thing as truth, it simply can't be known. But secondly, naturally we might be asking, Jesus is the truth about what? Again, it's about the Father. Many people's concept of God is far from the truth, ranging from a cruel and capricious tyrant to a boar who's out there to spoil people's fun or a kindly grandfather figure in the sky. But through Christ, we learn the truth about God. When we see Jesus spending time with outcasts and lepers, we are seeing what God is like. When we see Jesus spending time with theologians like Nicodemus, we are seeing what God is like. When we see Christ on the cross, we are seeing the heart of God. So through Christ, we have learned the truth about God, that he is loving and holy and just. And thirdly and finally, and ultimately, what we're seeing here is that truth is a person. It is not a number or a theory, but a person. The truth about everything ultimately lies in the creator and designer of the universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is a living person, which brings us to Jesus' claim to be the life. Later in John 14, Jesus told his disciples that he would not leave them as orphans that one day he would return for them. And between that future day and now, he would come to them. He would reveal himself to them in a way that the world would not see. Indeed, he and the Father would come and make their dwelling with them. Wow. And so another disciple speaks up called Judas, not Iscariot. He just couldn't grasp this. So he asked the question, and a great question that is, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us, but not to the world? Jesus' answer is this, because I live, you also will live. The basis of Christianity is not simply Jesus as the way and the truth. It is Jesus as the life. Jesus is a living person. And God has given us his spirit Orphans in this world have to get through life without a living relationship with their parents. But it will not be like that in the Christian life, Christ explains. Jesus is not simply the founder of Christianity. He lives today. And because he lives, we also live. We share in his life. Not simply that he sustains everything, including our physical life, by the power of his word but we share in his life at the very highest level, that is spiritual life, the life of God himself. Just as Christ has been raised from the dead, we have been made alive through him, raised to walk in newness of life. God has given us a spirit. We are in Christ, spiritually joined to Christ if we trust in him. 
We share in his life. This is a relationship that the world, people who have not been born again of the Spirit of God, simply doesn't understand. They don't understand how we can find the Bible so interesting, a living book. They don't understand the joy that comes from time spent in prayer or corporate worship. They don't understand the satisfaction we receive from obeying Christ, from sharing the gospel and making disciples because they don't share the life of the Spirit. And that is God's spiritual reality now, today, in 2020. And as we follow Christ, the relationship deepens and we get to know him better. He comes to us and reveals himself to us. Even though there's no audible voice, no vision, it is real. Just as with the two walking towards Emmaus, who didn't initially know it was Jesus with them, but later realised That what they had felt deep within them when the stranger had explained the scriptures to them was real evidence of Jesus coming to them. One day, as believers, we will go to the Father's house and be with Christ. But Christ holds out the promise to us that in this life, we can experience the spiritual reality of the Father and the Son in our lives. So under what conditions will this be a living reality for us and all listening right now? Well, if we love him, we will keep his word. So the basic first condition is devotion to Christ. The second, devotion to Christ will naturally lead to wanting to find out all we can about him through his word, as we are doing right now. Because Bible study is not simply for preachers and academics. And as we find out from his word what he is like, how he thinks, his plans and his purposes and what pleases him, then thirdly, out of love for him, we will seek to do what pleases him. As we do that, we will experience more and more the reality of this special relationship of God present in our hearts. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What we've seen is that Christianity is about a person and is utterly unique. No other philosopher or religious leader claimed to be God incarnate and offer true life. We've seen that Jesus is the only way to relationship with God. For the Father is in him and he is in the Father. Jesus is the exact representation of God. For he is God incarnate. Therefore, he is the truth about the Father. And we also learn that, and we're reminded that Jesus is alive. He died, but he rose again. Therefore, death is defeated. This world is not the end. And by believing and trusting in him today, we receive forgiveness of all our sins and immediately receive his presence by the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing eternal life. So at the start of chapter 14 in John, Jesus said to his disciples, believe in who I am, know where I am going, know I am coming back. If you want to experience what Christ is preparing for us, you've got to make room for him in your heart now. Will you?
Father, thank you for the gift of eternal relationship with you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the reminder again today that you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the exact representation of who God is. And I pray, Lord, that all of us listening, whatever we're going through, struggling with, any challenges, that this message might bring great comfort and joy and strength to keep going with our eyes fixed on you for the week ahead. But I also pray, O Lord, that you might open the hearts and minds of those listening who do not have that relationship with you. May they see and may they respond in belief and trust that you are who you say you are, God incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our King, our Redeemer. And it's in his mighty name that we pray. Amen.